Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and check the waiting room. There's nobody in there, and I'm going to go ahead and get started. Okay, so today's agenda is from 8 to 9, or actually from 8 to 8.45, a general session. I'm going to be talking about monitoring compliance. Um, I'm going to throw some more resources up there and then hopefully give you guys at least 10 to 15 minutes for questions. If we don't have a lot of questions, then it'll just be uh, 15 minutes more that you get um, of your day. Um, and if I didn't say it, I hope all of you had a great weekend. I know it was pretty hot and sticky. But I still remember what it was like um, the first weekend, first week in May when we all, when we got snow down here in Topsom. So I still remember that when we have hot, sticky days. Um, and if you want to, um, I'm going to try to monitor the uh, chat room. Uh, but as I said last week, I'm the only one doing this from the team. So um, if it's easier, you can always unmute yourself. Uh, or you can put your hand up on the part um, and I'll try to remember to look at the participate uh, participant list. Um, from nine to two or roughly around that time, um, districts did sign up for individual TA sessions. Um, and this can be for what you guys want it to be. Um, initially, it was to help with an uh, 21 ESCA application. But if you want to talk about other things, we can do that as well. Um, and I know I have a couple of updates. Um, one, the Title I allocations are up to date, so those should be your accurate allocations. They're not just $100 in there. Uh, we did have some uh, technical, we did have some bugs with the Title IV transfer and all use lines. Those have been corrected, hopefully. Um, so make sure if you're still struggling with that, just send me um, a screenshot or if you're if you're ready, if you are signed up today, we can talk about that as well. Um, and I think that is it. So just like last week, I'm going to give you guys a little pre-assessment um, to see what you know. And hopefully by the end of this session, you'll be able to answer all these questions if you haven't already been able to. So if you want to just take a scratch sheet of paper, if you want to do it by memory, um, just take a few minutes and answer these pre-assessment questions. Um, is a district, and we're not going to do the answers until the end, so you don't need to um, scramble and try to figure out the answer right now. Um, just think about it. So one, is a district required by ESSA to have an opt-out of testing policy? Two, when does a district CNA need to be submitted to the main DOE? Three, what is required when budgeting Title IV projects? And I was giving you a little hint that it has something to do with schools. Four, if a district has no EL students, do they need to have an allow plan? And five, what notification requirement is similar to the right to know requirement regarding teacher certification? And again, I'm gonna give you a few more minutes to answer those questions. Um, and we'll do the, we'll review them at the end with the responses. Um, and then I have two bonus questions. Um, who is the contact person for the school improvement funding awarded to schools identified for tier three supports? And two, what are the required elements for testing transparency? Hint, section 6A CNA is where you would um, find this answer. So I'm going to give a few more, give about two more minutes, and then we'll keep moving on. And if you want to just uh, put your thumbs up in, in, your, in your participant, that way I'll know you guys are ready to move on. Thank you.
So I'm gonna give you one more minute. I know it's a Monday morning, um, bright and early, but as I've told some other people, um, our Zoom account is shared with all the EICA um, team members. So um, I'm kind of limited on when, I was limited on when I could schedule these. And I wanted to do them toward the beginning of July because I know many of you are trying to get your ESEA applications completed before you try to take some sort of vacation before school um, restarts in the fall in whatever form or fashion that is going to be for your district. Okay, hold on to your answers and we're gonna review those at the end. Okay, so some of you on the call actually were monitored this year. Um, and so um, I wanted to give you an update on monitoring. So that's why FY19 and 20 and FY2021 monitoring is on here. Um, on the left side of the slide, I just went ahead and kind of outlined, summarized why we have to monitor. Um, we are responsible, we're considered to be the pass-through agency for this federal funding. But part of the responsibilities of the pass-through uh, agency is that we're responsible for the oversight and management of the programs and activities under ESEA, um, which was amended by the Every Child Succeeds Act. And then the uh, EDGAR, which I'm sure you guys have heard about, but I actually wrote out what it stands for, what the acronym actually means. It's the Education Department General Administration Regulations. It requires that the SEA uh, monitor grants to ensure compliance with applicable federal requirements and that performance goals are being achieved. So it gives the state uh, pass-through agency, says you have to monitor, but we're gonna allow you to do it you know, as long as you're meeting the minimum requirements. So, the end of last year, the end of 2000, actually the beginning of 2019, we decided to work or try to collaborate with special services with their monitoring. So we, we, we um, revamped our monitoring uh, process to try to more align with um, special services. We redid the, how it looks, our, our spreadsheet, all these kind of things, our monitoring process to try to align with what special services were was doing and what we were even went on their cycle, their cycle of schools. So we try to jump on their cycle of how they were going to be uh, monitoring schools. Uh, we even tried to um, copy um, some of their actual wordage, verbiage, and also their, um, their just processes. So in November, 2019, um, but before that in September, about 35 districts were notified that they were going to be monitored. Um, they were desk monitored, which means they had to turn in documentation. We gave them a list of, of items that they had to turn in uh, based on the different pieces of the statute. Um, and all this is on the web page, which I'll show you. I'll give you that resource for that um, at the end of the presentation. January, 20, uh, January of 2020, um, the districts had already submitted their documentation. The team reviewed. Um, we each had different sections that we had to review. Um, after that review, some districts had to resubmit documents. Some were selected for on-site visits based on the number of findings that they had, and some had to do both. We were in the process of starting to do some of these on-site visits and also going back and forth and giving some documentation to the districts that had resubmitted and we're just waiting to hear back. But then as you guys all know, March, March happened and all of our monitoring was put on hold uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. We were directed not to put any more stress on our districts and to just, you know, basically put on pause. And just recently, um, at the end of June, July, we were allowed to restart monitoring. We're not really sure what this is gonna look like yet, uh, we know we need to wrap up FY1920 because we need to get that underway or get that finished, but we're not really sure yet how we're going to um, do 2021. We have a lot of different scenarios. Uh, we know we need to finish up 1920, but we also know that we're not going to do site visits. Um, we're going to try to do everything virtually. We are also going to try to provide some more TA support virtually for those districts that need to finish up their 1920 monitoring, but then also help prepare 
um, those districts that are selected for 2021. I put TBD because we're still trying to figure out the best way not to overload um, our districts, but at the same time, um, unlike special services, special services has a, has a dedicated team just for monitoring, whereas the ESEA team, this is in addition to our other responsibilities. So we want to make sure it's manageable not only for the districts, but it's also manageable for us. So I'm going to take a pause here. If you have any questions about general questions about this, I can answer that. Um, you can unmute yourself or you can put um, a question in the chat. So I'm gonna uh, stop talking for about a minute. Okay, and again, if you have any questions that pop up, just put them in the chat or unmute yourself. That's completely okay. So these were some of the things that we took away after monitoring those 30, 35 districts. And so rather than um, we know we need to do some work, um, I've worked with the Title I Committee of Practitioners and we've actually re worded some of our um, Title I requirements. We reworded them in the document so that they're easier to understand um, and that districts have a better idea of what we're asking for. So we're working on that. We're also, like I said, we're gonna to try to do some TA webinars to help support districts not only finish up their 1920 year, monitoring year, but also get prepared if they're selected for the 2021 year. So the first thing is CNA. The, up, um, the CNA does need to be updated every year. Um, and if you're, any of your schools in your district have a school-wide um, school authority, then that, that CNA also needs to be updated annually. Um, CNA, CNAs are kept locally at the school and district unless requested by the main DOE or during ESCA monitoring. Um, I didn't have this in the, the slide, but I just want to add that we did have, we have had a couple of districts reach out to us and ask us because of COVID-19 and because of the requirements um, for bringing students back for face-to-face, -face, uh, we've been asked a lot of questions about, can we do this? Can we do this? Can we do this? Can we do this? Um, and what our answer is, it needs to go back to your CNA. So um, if you're planning on doing something different because of COVID-19, and you want to use some of your title funds, you still need to make sure that you're still fulfilling some of, fulfilling the, um, the items that you were gonna do in your CNA. Um, and I don't wanna get too much into the weeds, but if you have specific questions about this, go ahead and reach out to your regional program in it. Sorry, guys are my regional. I'm so used to saying this for general, I apologize. But you can reach out to me um, through an email. Um, if you're scheduled for your individual TA session today, um, we can talk, we can talk it through more specifically rather than generally like I am doing right now. Um, two, ESSA references. We understand you guys are super busy and many of you who are doing the ESCA role have probably 15 other hats that you're wearing, but a part of the requirement is that all documentation needs to reference ESSA and not NCLB. Um, that includes any board policies, any school procedures, any plans, student handbooks, uh, family handbooks, any of your websites, they all need to reference ESSA. And this could be just a quick, you know, just go in there and change it from NCLB to ESSA. Uh, we found that that was quite common um, for uh, a lot of districts. Uh, three, EL identification and programs, uh, again, any of your, your LAO plan, any of your procedures or policies that refer to EL identification or programs, they also have to be updated to reflect ESSA. If you have any NCLB references, they need to be pulled out and replaced with ESSA. And Title IV, so this is one of the questions um, on the pre-assessment. When you're doing Title IV, um, you have to provide justification for how the districts leverage Title IV funds and how they prioritized funding for schools. Hold on a minute, guys. I'm not sure if my recording stopped.
Okay, I'm going to keep going, but I'm not sure if my recording just stopped, so we'll check that out. I'm going to stop my share for a second. Okay, we're good. Okay, we are back in business. So again, also um, another piece that we noticed was notifications. So rather than go really deep into these pieces, these are kind of the general ones that we noticed. The testing transparency cycle, um, this is what uh, section 10, sorry, section 6A of your CNA where you list what assessments you're, you're giving, um, what's the time frame for the assessments, how long the assessments are going to happen, why are you doing the assessments, uh, what, how are you going to use the assessment, and then how are you going to communicate this um, assessment results to parents or how they're going to be used. This should all be outlined in section 6A of your CNA. Um, you may have some missing pieces to that, um, and um, as I say later down in the slide, um, Jackie and I are working on creating a template for districts so they can just go in and use that template and update it. Um, they may just need to update a, a column or add another piece into their CNA to make this um, compliant. Um, testing participation. So this is the one that we always get some districts that um, we had a back and forth and a lot of confusion on this one. And um, so what testing participation is, is that you have to, just like the right to know, a parent has a right to know of a, of a teacher's um, qualifications for teaching, their certification. You don't have to list the certification for all these teachers, but you do have to put in a handbook or on the website saying that if a parent wants to have access or wants to see what their child's teacher, uh, what their child's certification require or certification is, they can request it and they can see what it is. The same thing happens with the testing participation. If you have any participation procedures or policies that are around uh, part participating in any form of testing, both local and state, so if you have, if you give the NWEA and that is a local assessment and you tell your district and you have a participation requirement that all students must participate and this is a policy or um, a board policy or it's a procedure at your school, then um, you have to notify parents not of the policy, but you need to put a little um, explanation or a little notification either on your website, in your handbook that says, if you would like to see our testing participation policy, please contact so-and-so. So you don't have to give parents the participation policy. You don't need to create a, po a participation policy if you don't have one, but you do need to notify parents that if they want to see that participation policy or policies, then you have to put it in there just like the right to know teacher certification requirement. There's a little bit of confusion about that. This also inadvertently got transferred or translated or summarized into that a district has to have an opt-out policy for testing. This is not correct. A district does not, is not required to have an opt-out of testing policy. But if a district does have an opt-out of testing policy or procedure, if a parent gets this notification that says they have a right to see any testing participation policy or procedure that's put out by the district, if there is an opt-out policy, then this policy needs to be included in the other policies for participation. And I can talk you through more the, oh, about this if you have any questions. Again, we're working on a template right now, um, kind of the wording to help districts with their notification, similar to the notification for teacher certification. Um, English learner, you do need to have um, an allow plan, even if you don't have any EL students, it needs to be updated for ESSA. Um, we're working on a template for that as well. Um, there is some guiding questions that you can use for that, 
what we're working, we're trying to work on a, um, April Perkins is working on a template for that. And then your parent involvement policies, plans, and procedures, those all need to be um, updated. They also need to meet all the different requirements that are set out by ESSA. Um, and again, I think we had at one point, we had it on the website. I think it might be a little outdated, but I think there is something still on there about that. Um, what I found the biggest kind of finding was that districts with multiple elementary schools would have one parent involvement um, plan. Um, and each school who, that has Title I funds has to have their own plan. And I keep going back between a policy and a plan, and I, I apologize. Um, policies usually are considered to be like board decisions. So some, um, some people, when they think of policy, they think it's a board. So um, that's where you get your KBF one, your KBF uh, board policy and maybe your KBF one. But then you can also have a plan, which is just set out by the district. So there's, there's different pieces of that. Um, and then, so usually policy is what the board does and then a plan is what the school itself creates. Um, and then six is the fiscal requirement. Um, uh, you do need, if you have, if you purchase any equipment with, with uh, federal funds, there is an inventory requirement or an inventory list that's required and there's certain pieces that are required. And then also time and effort, there are pieces required for that. And again, these are just larger takeaways that we found from doing the monitoring um, back in when we were viewing the documents in December and January. Here's the link, the ESA monitoring tool link. Um, you can click on that and that gives you the grid. Uh, we will be working on that and monitoring, uh, updating that for the 2021, because we know that we need to work on some of the uh, way we worded it. We're, like I said, we're working on templates for LEAs um, for the notifications for the testing uh, participation and also um, the assessment cycle and um, putting some examples of what um, your plan should include. Um, for those of you who have nothing else to do, and I know that's um, laughable at this point in time because many of you are taxed with doing a lot of other things right now, um, all of the requirements uh, for the parent uh, involvement plans are outlined in section 1116. And I was going to list it in this PowerPoint, but I figured that this PowerPoint already had a lot in it. And what I'm probably going to do is create a separate webinar slash uh, PowerPoint slide, which will just say parent notifications. Um, I do know at our next session, if you're able to attend on the 20th, I am going to focus just on notifications. I'm going to hopefully put some examples in on the um, in the PowerPoint. Um, so I think that is it. And this is just for your information. Not going to go through all of this, but I know many of you are going to come back and reference this um, PowerPoint. So if you think about um, if you got a finding for your inventory, here are all the requirements that your inventory has to have. Uh, many of you already have um, templates for your inventory. You just want to double check that they meet all of these requirements. And compliance. This is just more of kind of a summary. Um, I know with COVID-19, um, a lot of things have been changed and evolved and waived, uh, but I wanted to just stress that ESCA funds, all federal funds, have certain requirements that have to be followed. Regarding any ESCA funds, one, we have to follow the statute, which was amended by ESSA. Two, we have to follow any of the EDGAR requirements. Underneath that is the Code of Federal Regulations that we have to uh, follow. Four is UG, which is the Uniform Grant Guidance. And then five is any applicable main statutes and governing practices. So those are all of the, the laws and regulations that we have to try to um, follow when we're approving any of the plans or expenses that you guys wanna get in, invoiced for. As I stress with several of you, COVID-19 does not eliminate any of these requirements, 
Waivers have been granted for certain requirements of FY19 and 20 funds, but the statute, the rules, and the guidance have not gone away. So I'm telling you that up front. So if, for example, you asked to do something and we're like, well, we're going to work with you, but we're also going to say, I don't know how that, how we can work around a certain statute. For example, I had a, a district ask me if they could do, if they could purchase um, gift cards to help parents drive their kids to school. You, I don't I think it's under UGG. You cannot purchase, you cannot use federal funds to ever purchase uh, gift cards. But you can use federal funds to reimburse parents um, going, um, you know, in some form or fashion. Maybe they're transporting their child to school, maybe they're attending uh, a family night or something like that. You can do that. You just have to follow your district's reimbursement policy um, however, whatever that policy is for how they reimburse non-employees or how they reimburse employees, that's what you have to follow is whatever your district um, reimbursement policy is. So no, you can never, it's never allowable to buy gift cards with federal funds, but you can reimburse people with federal funds. You just have to follow your district's um, reimbursement policy. Um, and I just want to stress too that we've gotten a lot of um, questions about tier three funding. In reality, there is no tier three funding. Um, just like with everything in education, we tend to truncate it and make it easy to remember. School improvement funds every year have to be allocated to um, help support uh, schools that have been identified for additional supports. This year, or actually last year, they started calling them tier three because in ESSA, it, it says you have to identify schools that need additional support or tier three support. So the tier three support got kind of morphed into, oh, tier three schools and tier three funding. So we're trying to really work with districts to understand that it's not tier three funding. It's school improvement funds that were allocated to schools that were identified for tier three supports. So when you come to, you ask me a question, you're like, and it's about tier three, I'm gonna refer you to um, Cheryl Lang. Um, she's the one now that is um, approving all uh, projects or um, activities under school improvement funds that have been earmarked and allocated for schools that were identified for tier three supports. It was Shelly, um, but since um, Cheryl started with the team as the ESCA director, um, she is now going to be overseeing all of those projects that schools um, are applying for with school improvement funds, i.e. tier three um, funds. And I know that there's been a lot of questions about this programming for the summer. Um, and again, all those questions, I funnel all those questions to, uh, we'll be follow, uh, funneling all of them to Cheryl. Uh, and then the ESSER funds. I know many of you as ESCA coordinators were also tasked with um, figuring out what those funds were gonna be used for. Neither the school improvement funds nor the um, ESSER funds are included in the FY21 ESC application. So you have to apply, you have to apply for the school improvement funds um, for those schools identified for tier three supports and ESSER funds, you're gonna apply for them under separate applications. So uh, we're trying, they are considered to be separate funding streams outside of the traditional ESCA application. Okay, so it looks like I'm going to be ending a little early, but that's okay. Uh, Pre-assessment. So is a district required by ESSA to have an opt-out of testing policy? Hopefully you guys said no. <laughs> Um, and if you did, give yourself a little clap uh, because that was very confusing for many of our districts and even some of our team members. Um, two, when does a district CNA need to be submitted to the main DOE? Uh, the reauthorization of ESCA and or ESCA monitoring. Three, what is required when budgeting Title IV projects? You have to prioritize schools with the most need. And then four, 
if a district has no EL students, do they need to have a LAO plan? Yes, this is a requirement of civil rights. It doesn't have anything to do with ESEA. Although um, in the past, under before, e, before ESSA came around, um, all of the Title III requirements, all of the EL requirements fell under Title III. That is a change under ESSA. ESSA students can still be, they can be a Title, um, they can be a Title I student and an EL student at the same time, and they can, be, they can receive services as a Title I student and also as an EL student, so they can get both of those services. And they can also receive services as a special ed student. So you can get, yes, and people get confused, you can't, you, like, well, if I, they're special ed, then they can't get Title I, and that's not true. If they're Title I, they can't also get EL services. That is not true. They can technically get all three of them. Uh, we don't, we, we ask districts to work with all the different service providers to make sure that students are not being pulled out of their regular classroom on a daily basis or on a regular, like all the time because of all the different services they're getting. So we ask them to work with all the different service providers to make sure that um, students are in the regular classroom as much as possible. Um, and then five, what notification requirements? Uh, requirement is similar to the right to know requirement regarding teacher certification, testing transparency, and then the bonus, who's the person, the contact person for school improvement funding? That is Cheryl Lang, she's our new ESCA director. And then hopefully you got three of these requirements because I only asked for three. Um, and that is you need to put the grade level, subject matter, purpose, design, and use. Um, the source, like is it NWA, is it the Empower? Um, duration, time of the year, timeline, and format for sharing results. Any questions? Promise I'm going to stop talking in about two minutes and open it up for lots of, for any questions. So here are our resources. Um, I will send these out resources out to you. And we do have a uh, frequently asked questions on our webpage. We have the Federal Grant Management Handbook, um, Title I specific spending handbooks. Um, I also referenced the ESCA Spring Training uh, Webinar 2020 because we talk probably the last 20 minutes of the webinar is all on monitoring. And so I put the reference, so if you want to skip through everything and just go to minute 36, 33, that's when we start our monitoring uh, review. And then if you have any questions about time and effort, they're all, um, everything is on this. We're really trying to get as many resources as possible on our webpage. And that is it, so questions. Um, and then you can see the schedule. Um, and what I recommend is that um, at the end of this general session, you just log off and then log back on with the same account information um, when your time is um, ready. So nine is Calus, 10 is RSU 30, 11 is Madawaska, 12 is RSU 70, and East Range is one. If for some reason you weren't able to schedule any TA time with me, just send me an email and we'll try to work something out. Um, you guys know my contact information. And session three um, is to really hone in a little bit more on notification, um, any programming requirements, kind of maybe delve a little bit more into what the um, parent involvement plans should include. And if there's any kind of a general um, difference between school-wide and targeted. Any questions? Good question, Sophia. Um, sorry, no, Sophia. <laughs> sorry, I just saw the name, but it's actually um, Tamara. Um, so uh, the Lao plan, um, of course, I cannot remember. Okay, now I remember, yeah. So LAU or the Lao, that is actually the name of the so this was a lawsuit that was filed in California 
um, Lau was the name of the student who filed the lawsuit and said that um, her rights were not being uh, followed as an EL student. So they went to court, they won. Um, and part of the requirement is that, that each district has to have a plan, they call it the Lau plan, that outlines how, there's a lot of different pieces, they have to outline how an EL student will be identified, what support services will be provided for EL students, what's the identification process, um, and then all these different pieces. And that's why um, it is a requirement of every district, no matter where they are in the United States, that they have to have a Lau plan uh, that is a, a civil rights requirement and I, I'm trying to remember where it is located. I will do some um, looking around and before I send out these links I will try to find the actual um, support kind of a it's a template that April created to help guide districts through their law plans. Um, I know some like I know I'm gonna I'm going to uh, um, I know there's a couple of districts on the call today that actually had lots of questions about the Lau plan. Um, and as I said, you don't need to throw the baby out with the bathwater. You just need to go through your plan and make sure it has all the pieces that are now required under, actually they're not now required under ESSA, they were always required under ESEA or even NCLB, but they've just been more refined at this point. Um, yeah, so, so it's funny because um, Tamara said, uh, we have it somewhere, which is a really good, I'm glad you put that in the, in the chat because that's what we found um, during, <laughs> during monitoring. People were pulling out plans or like, oh, I think this is a Lau plan. So that's why I'm trying to review it with districts now to get it on their, on their kind of radar that if they are monitored, they're not scrounging around trying to find it. If you have some time, look through it now so that you're not under crunch time if your district does get selected for monitoring for 2021 or you're trying to finish up 1920, um, you know, look at it and try to figure out if there's pieces that you need to add or pieces that you need to take out. Um, so that's always something to think about. Any other questions? And I apologize, I keep looking at two screens because you guys are up on one screen and the PowerPoint is on another one. Okay, if you guys have um, no one or have don't have any other questions, I'm going to stop recording.